Well, thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate that kind introduction. I'm not sure I want to say anything and screw up what you're thinking right now. That was pretty good. I'd like to take you on the road if I could as well. Uh, well, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, George Mason. Dean, I know the Dean is here somewhere. I saw him a minute ago. Dean, what? You got the back seat. All right. That's how you, you're a working Dean. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and take a few minutes. Uh, and I don't want to go long. You have some very, very distinguished analysts. Uh, and I wish I could stay for that. Maybe you'll send me the CD. Uh, I can catch up. I just wanted to talk about a few things. So back, I first get on the committee in 2004 uh, and get my first classified briefing uh, on cyber activities in the United States and around the world. And it was one of those things that something we might want to pay attention to, something that could become an issue we can't handle. Uh, and unfortunately, exponentially since that day, uh, it, got, it grew worse and more complicated uh, and an issue that is a serious threat to our national security, of which America is not prepared to handle. Uh, it is amazing to watch, even just the last couple of years, about nation states, what I would argue are not rational actors. North Korea, Iran, developing and building its cyber capability uh, to not only, well, they're not interested in espionage, let's put it that way. They are interested in attack and disruption. Uh, and when you have non-rational actors who have that capability, uh, you know, I'm only 20 years old, look at me. Uh, I worry about this every single night uh, when we go through our, our daily prep briefings uh, and policy decisions during the course of the day. This is alive and well, and we are in a cyber war, and we just don't know it as average Americans. It's that bad. I just happened to come back from New York uh, talking to a few folks, somebody who should know better, who didn't, who was uh, a, someone who was involved uh, in a venture, small venture capital company, uh, had heard some of the rumblings about cybersecurity. Now this is somebody who's investing, it's a small fund, about a billion and a half dollars. They went back and said, you know, you just, just spurred us on to check our systems to see, but we're just too small for anyone to pay attention to. So they brought in a security company uh, and found that the Chinese had been on his network probably they were estimating between six and eight months. This is a small firm when it comes to venture capital firms in a city like New York. It is so prolific, so dangerous, uh, and so bad. Uh, we had better do something now, or on our collective watch, we will destroy the economic prosperity uh, of the United States. And I don't say that lightly. We have uh, several different realms now you have to get to, rings of political hacktivists, people who are trying to make a point, anonymous. You have individual criminals, you know, the guys in the bunny slippers in their mother's basement who are trying to break into your account and steal a few bucks. Organized criminals internationally who are well-trained, well-schooled, many of them former intelligence officers from places like Russia. And you have that cyber espionage the Chinese have engaged in, which is no comparison in history of the amount of economic wealth that they have stolen uh, from not only just the United States, but other uh, innovation economies, Japan and Germany and South Korea and France and Great Britain, and the list does not stop. If you have something of value, they have geared their, their military and intelligence services to configure a way to make a priority, to steal intellectual property, to bring it back to China, to repurpose it, develop it, and put it into the market. It is a horrible, uh, presents a horrible competition disadvantage for company, uh, countries like the United States who are so heavily uh, dependent on our innovation for the next generation. One of the things that we have to do is begin to protect ourselves first. So here's how we do it. As the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, it's my job, as the director can tell you, to be on these folks uh, and say, you know, what do we know about X? We've got to fill in whole Y. We need information about these three things. So we push them and they come back with their uh, proposals and they go out and do their work around the world. And they go out and find out what bad actors are doing in the cyber arena. They bring that information back and we use that to protect our dot mill networks. And candidly, our dot mill networks are very well protected, probably the best in the world. Problem is about 90%, actually 80% of all of the networks across the United States are private networks. And so we are prohibited from sharing that information with the public sector, 
uh, and private sector, excuse me, uh, in a meaningful way that they might be able to protect their own networks. You know, I was an FBI agent in Chicago. If somebody called me and said, hey, there's going to be a home invasion at 123 Street tonight at 6 o'clock, I am morally obligated to do something about it. I'll contact the local police to show up ourselves to make sure that that person doesn't get through the front door and cause some harm. Think about what this cyber activity is. It is no different than a company wanting to pick up that 911 call and say, we are under attack and we need some help. So what we've said is, listen, to all the talk about offensive capability and <clears throat> developing an offensive capability in the United States, and we have lots of debates about that, believe me, are all worthy debates. None of it means a thing if we cannot protect our networks here at home. And candidly, we are not ready to protect our networks here at home. So we talk about Chinese espionage, that last ring, military style attack. And so we have, uh, Several nations have used it. Russia, clearly, uh, in Estonia, 2007. If you recall, when they tore down Lenin's statue, they were a little miffed, apparently. Uh, and they used a very aggressive cyber attack on Estonia. Severe damage, shut them down, scared them to death, by the way. So I'm not one of the most vocal advocates uh, for government's assistance in protecting networks you'll find uh, is Estonia. And I highly recommend you meet the ambassador. She'll, she'll school you well uh, on the threats of cybersecurity. They also used it uh, as prepping the battlefield in South Ossetia before they went into Georgia. So they had a very aggressive cyber attack, uh, disruption of their electric grid, their financial services network, then they sent in the soldiers and the tanks. So we know that nation states, including China, by the way, have this capability and are eager to put it into their arsenal. Now there's one thing about this, Russia and China are not likely uh, to go after our financial services networks, not likely, unless we are in direct conflict. They're rational actors as to the consequences of that kind of very disruptive behavior. And I argue the Chinese wouldn't want to go after our financial services networks. We owe them too much money. Oh, come on. <laughs> so you have those rational actors. Here's where it gets concerning, and we should be concerned today. South Korea showed, or excuse me, North Korea showed that they, not about a month ago, had a capability to go in and they attacked a financial institution in South Korea and did some damage. <coughs> now it's probably not where the other, well, I can say not probably, it is not where the other nation states are, but it shows they have a growing investment in their ability to conduct cyber attacks um, that have real consequences. Iran clearly has exponentially gotten better and is learning every day. If you're not familiar with the Saudi Aramco case, I recommend that you get uh, familiar with it. It shows what a nation state can do when it sets its resources to attack a single business to cause destruction and harm to that particular establishment. So they attacked Saudi Aramco, a very important energy uh, company in Saudi Arabia, the, the largest nation state owned of Saudi Arabia. It does all their transactions and clearances uh, financial transaction clearances for the country when it comes to oil and gas. So think about this. You show up at work, you have, say, 10,000 computers. You show up to work that day and 7,000 of those computers don't work anymore. And everything that's on those computers is gone. Not when you can't reboot it, you're not going to find it again. It's gone. You can't even turn it on. It is a paperweight on your desk. They destroyed 30,000 machines in the attack on Saudi Arabia, 30,000. Here's where it really gets interesting. They also went in and manipulated data. So instead of Mike Rogers owing Saudi Aramco $100, they had it turned around the other way. They manipulated data, they destroyed data, and then they destroyed machines. The scary part was it almost uh, caught fire in the telecommunications network. It spilled over. I don't think that was by design. I think that was just by uh, the propagation of this particular malware that almost shut down and destroyed uh, certain pieces of equipment in the telecommunications air, uh, phone com private companies that are operating in that particular region. And it doesn't take too far, if you understand common communications, that that can hop pretty quickly, not only across the Middle East, but across continents, across oceans, and get to a place like the United States. And if that doesn't worry you enough, Imagine that. So we now know that, according to public reports, Iran has been lapping at our shores 
and probing our financial services institutions. Not with their best stuff. Their best stuff was, we believe, Saudi Aramco Plus. But here, just trying to find vulnerabilities in our financial services networks. Why is that a problem? Imagine a bank that does, say, $8 trillion, $9 trillion in transaction clearances a day. It gets attacked, and the data is lost, the machines are broken, uh, and we have what we would call chaos in a hurry. They know it. They're not a rational actor. They're corner dogs at this point in the world, isolated, clearly. And they're on the offense. This is a huge problem. It is not Orwellian. It's not Hollywood. It's today. The problem is most people at home don't have any understanding of the impact and how that might impact their lives. Uh, trust me, if you have money in a 401k account, you'll be impacted. Uh, if your check for those federal employees, uh, if some of these banks clear a whole bunch of federal transactions, that stops. Meaning social security checks can stop for a period of time. And try to imagine going back and reconfigure that in a timely way to get people their checks. So you can compound this pretty quickly and get to a place where chaos is the reign of the day. And here's why I think this is important and why we have to have this debate. No, I'll stop talking, take some questions. The internet is one sixth of our economy today. If we want to maintain the, the economic engine, I would argue the freedom engine that the internet has brought, not just to us, but the world, people have to have faith that it works for them and not against them. If you want a free and open internet, we better take some steps today to make sure that we can protect it and maintain the confidence that when you use the internet, somebody's not stealing you money. Now you imagine that happens with a bank, and it happens at your bank, and it happens every time you use your credit card. You pretty soon will stop using the internet as a means of commercial transaction. I can't imagine what we look like if we start withdrawing from the commercial aspects of the internet. I think it's be a horrible outcome. So what we did is we stepped back quickly. My ranking member and I, Democrat from Maryland, uh, he's a prosecutor, a former FBI agent, so we figured we could talk the same language. I always say that FBI just do the work, prosecutors get all the credit. Isn't that right, Judge? <laughs> so we thought we'd have a marriage made in heaven here to sit down and start with a blank piece of paper. So we said, no, let's not bring anything to the table. Let's go out and talk to the Silicon Valley. Let's talk to the high-tech industry folks. Let's go to New York City and talk to those folks. Let's talk to the privacy groups. Let's talk to the end users, the, uh, the, every department in the government, and try to figure out what is the narrowest, least intrusive, non-government mandated way that we can provide cybersecurity information to the private sector so they can protect their own networks. Very simple. And we came up with a whopping 13-page bill I know somebody took a gasp by that, right? I, I was going to put in a 400-page amendment just to show you all how serious. I mean, nothing in it, but it's weighty. So through time, we've been working with those players. Last year, it passed in a bipartisan way, mainly by people who were exposed to the real threat of what's happening out there in the real world when it comes to cyber. So this year, we have been bringing members down, and uh, I call it the holy macro briefing. Uh, you come down, we expose members of Congress to what the real threats are in a classified environment, why we can't sleep at night, why this is a growing problem, why more nations are themselves investing in their capabilities to do this kind of thing, uh, because it's so lucrative for them, and how we can take a very narrow, small step to do something about it. Let's share the secret sauce, that information that we collect overseas of that really nasty, malicious source code, and share it with the private sector so they can protect their network. So when you're at home on your computer, you don't have to worry about somebody stealing your personal identity. Uh, you still will. However, we can make it a little more difficult for them to be successful. Uh, and vice versa, you know, it's common, the biggest misperception about this whole thing is that your national security agency or your CIA is plugged into the domestic internet circle, if you will. Uh, it's clearly not. It's illegal for them to do it. We monitor that very closely. It would have no benefit for them to do that. They are not on the domestic network. This wouldn't change that. Uh, all it does is say, we want the private sector when they get hit. So what happens is, a private sector company gets hit with something very complicated and very nasty. And by the way, remember, I could be a mid-sized company trying to fight off a nation state like China. You're going to lose that fight in the cyber world. I don't care how good you are. 
You get a thousand people getting up every single day with the sole purpose of getting into your system, guess what? They're going to get in your system. And so when they got hit with something, what we said is, we'll give you as much as we can on this, the, the malware side, and you tell you shoot something back that said, this is the 911 call I was telling you about, hey, we're under attack. We got this, and this happens in real time, by the way. Nobody really picks up the phone. If they have to pick up the phone, it won't work. <coughs> they, this, their machine <coughs> sends that nasty piece of code uh, to folks who understand it. They look at it, and they can go back overseas and find out where it came from. Just like you call a detective to come in and catch the burglar in your house, or what they left your house, same system. But it happens in real time, it'll happen 100 million times a second. Uh, and to give you an idea why that's important, the average credit card in your wallet, that company will get hit 300,000 times today alone by bad, bad actors trying to steal credit card numbers. 300,000 times today alone. Uh, I talked to one agency that got hit 600 million times last year. Six, one company, 600 million times in one year. Huge problem. So that's why I like to have drinks at these, um, <laughs> so that you can, uh, you know, either that or go right out to the open bar to do it. So what we're doing tomorrow is we're doing this, we're doing a markup. It's called that's the, the legislative jargon for taking a vote, working amendments on the bills in the intelligence committee. Again, that does that very narrow, simple thing. Have the government share what it knows, and when you get hit as a private sector, only if you want, 100% voluntary. You share that malicious source code back with the government so that the government can take it and try to figure out who the perpetrator is and build those signatures into their network so we can stop this stuff uh, from robbing us blind uh, as it is it's happening every day. So uh, we're uh, looking forward. Maybe I can take a few uh, few questions if I haven't depressed you enough already. Yes, sir. Uh, on the economic, cyber economic espionage front, if we're a system, of a nation of laws, rule of law, we have governmental information that we know that X hundred billion or trillion dollars of intellectual property is stolen. Why can't we look at using our court system to enter, go through the process, enter default judgments, and then start decrementing the debt we owe to the people who are violating our law? We, because we're members of the WTO, there are companies that choose that route. Uh, it is just not successful. If you have a country who is using its government military intelligence services to steal information for the sole purpose of building its economy, you can tell that the rule of law is not nearly as important to them as we would think. It works in a system where both parties believe in the rule of law. You go to court, some win, some lose, right? That's just the way our system is. If you respect that system, it works fantastic. If you don't respect that system, it will hardly work at all. So there are efforts underway to try to raise the pressure on countries like China. Um, and remember, that could grow at about 7% a year just to maintain their social program. <clears throat> grow. I mean, we'll be lucky if we hit 2% this year if we're lucky. If we're really lucky we'll have 2% growth. So you imagine it. So they're not great innovators, uh, but they have shown that they can be uh, great, uh, I don't want to use the word, but they're taking a lot of stuff. Right? And so they can take that material uh, and it helps them fulfill their need. So by us filing a charge and doing it that way, I don't think will work. I think by raising the pressure diplomatically, this should be the number one, number two, and number three bilateral discussion on any issue we talk about from China moving forward. Um, Got to get them there. Yes, sir. You talked about what your committee is doing. What cooperation are you getting from the Senate and the House on this? Oh, look at the time. Um, part of the problem is last year we, we, we got caught in the election cycle. So we got the bill out of my committee too late. Um, this year it's better, much better awareness. You cannot open the paper today without another example of, of a uh, cyber theft, cyber intrusion, hacking. Uh, that's helped, unfortunately. It's so one way that's helped build the awareness in both places. So the good news is I'm having a constructive dialogue so far with the White House uh, and constructive dialogue in the Senate. So we're going to get a bill by the end of this year that will get on the President's desk and get signed. I believe that. It, it, we are right in the middle of the making sausage part of that whole thing. 
And our goal is to protect privacy, civil liberties, let people understand exactly what the bill does. If people don't have faith that this thing is not intruding on their lives, it won't work. Um, we need to make sure that that's right, and it doesn't. It's not a surveillance program, it doesn't matter. So we're going through that process now, and we're going through this education process. I mean, if you know a member of Congress, I highly recommend you call them and say, you, you, whatever you're for on cybersecurity, you better get out there and start fixing it. Uh, this is a great opportunity to do that. Yes, sir. So practically everything we really know about the Chinese attacks is because brave private citizens from the GhostNet report to the Mandiant report to the Lucky Cab report to the Trend Micro got into their command and control servers and figured out what they were doing and learned a lot about them and revealed it to the public. We can't do this just with government resources. But you're under a lot of pressure and I fear I'm going to accept an amendment that basically says we're not, we're not going to give any additional authority to private sector guys who want to investigate who's attacking them. Uh, can't we find a way to make sure we leverage some of those resources and under proper supervision allow people to do more about that, investigating their attackers? And you're talking about the hacking back provision of the bill. Uh, I do worry a little bit about cyber vigilanteism because if you're not if you're not at the top end of that spectrum, you can get it wrong for sure. Absolutely. So we, one of the things we didn't want to do is get into establishing new law by allowing people to participate in stealing, stealing that or hacking that. However, that being said, in an information sharing uh, regimen, uh, it empowers the government to know more about what's hitting the private sector because we sometimes don't know. If we don't catch it overseas, and you don't call the FBI, the federal government does not know what business has been hacked, which has been part of our problem about trying to get a handle on it. So most people think that the government's sitting on the internet listening and all that. It doesn't happen. And so one of our challenges is how do we entice businesses to cooperate back so that we can find these new signatures out there? So we cannot, the government cannot do it without the private sector. It is impossible. Uh, private sector cannot do it without the, what the government does. I'll guarantee you it's impossible. Even your best CIO who tells you, got a handle on it, know exactly who they are, uh, no problems, my argument is find yourself in the CIO. Right? <laughs> um, because that we know for sure, and I would, the last estimate I heard from our intelligence services was that we would know almost 40% more of malicious source code that's laying on the shelf than the private sector even knows exists. So imagine the value of having that protect every network in America. But all you gotta do is get in the right. If you know what you're looking for, you can find it. That's the beautiful thing. But this stuff is so sophisticated and so complicated, you have to know what you're looking for. And that's the benefit that's that benefit of sharing that we hope gets away from the need. Because what you're gonna do is have somebody make a mistake and bring down a business uh, with and, and those unintended consequences can be very, very serious. Uh, you know, with botnets and uh, I will tell you that the, the sophistication, the good news is the government is getting better about catching on to how they do it, the signature-based attacks, but it's difficult. Is that, that may take you through five or six countries, a uh, hundred different cities, uh, before you find out where that thing uh, was written and, and sent, you know, when somebody pushed the send button. That's the challenge, and I would argue, knowing what we know on our side, even some of the best private sector companies wouldn't have the ability to track it all the way. Some can, a lot cannot. My fear would be those a lot that cannot could cause more harm than they do good. So that's why we're kind of at work with that. Yes, sir. What role do you see state and local governments in the cyber policy? Yeah, I mean, obviously the criminal part of this is important. We're dealing with, the, you know, as the intelligence guy, worried about what threats come into the country from overseas. I think. It's not limited to that. We, we have criminal problems here in the country. So part of that sharing needs to be from uh, federal to local and local to federal as well, because they can help us on, on signature-based attacks as well. Uh, and the more we know, the more we know, and by the way, in a classified setting, the more you can stop. Uh, and the goal is, can you make it so hard and so difficult as we move forward, which it's not now. It is, and I can't tell you how easy it is now. Can we make it so hard and difficult that it's not worth China investing as much money as they are in training a legion of cyber attack warriors? 
and intellectual property fees. And that's what they're doing. Now, how do we make that so it's not really, that does, has no dividend. And right now, their only consequence, there is no consequence. That's the problem. So that, that, that's why mm -hmm. we're the sharing regime between them. And then, then, then what you do is the state and the federal, would have, our state and local will be heading out trying to hopefully find those criminal elements that are operating within the United States, uh, conducting crimes here. Uh, and the FBI is going to be part of this as well. So you have that, hopefully, that dynamic in that way. Great. All in the back. Uh, in your markup of the bill, uh, do you intend to address at all DOS attacks on 911 uh, centers? Well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do it specifically by uh, institution. Uh, you would hope that that, that local unit of government um, would, would participate. Uh, it's, again, this is all voluntary. There's no mandates in this whatsoever. I don't think that would work. Um, and so you hope that they, they participate. You, uh, the FBI has, is, I will tell you, is getting better and better and better when it comes to the forensic cybercrime part. Uh, there are discussions about, hey, how do you try to stop it before it hits? Uh, that is a much more difficult proposition. Um, and one that we wrestle with quite a bit based on what the FBI's duties and assignments are here in the United States. So uh, we hope through this sharing regimen you can get at a lot of that. Uh, and here's the other benefit when, you're, when that 911 center is, is hit, God forbid, if you have real time sharing capability and you're part of that loop, uh, it is much easier to use the capability of, say, the FBI, who has this growing cyber capability, to find them quickly uh, and have somebody hold off in handcuffs and put them in jail. And you're risking people's lives when you do that. Uh, pretty soon. Thank you. A couple more. I don't know how much how many more you want to. I don't have a great panelist here. <laughs> Panel right. of panelists. Well, we know, or at least some of us know, that the Iranians have been targeting and hacking uh, second tier uh, government contractors. Do you believe that uh, there should be a cybersecurity standard in order to get a government contract? Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is you don't want to be exclusionary. Uh, and you want to find, to me, the best, most cost-effective way to allow those companies to operate. <coughs> so in the Defense Department, you're going to see this anyway. What we're, what we're finding as well is not only in some of the defense contracts saying you got to have at least these elements. I, I would be very reluctant to have a legislated standard that starts getting the government into setting the standards through rules about what a secure network looks like. which. That's the other side of our argument, but a lot of people are pushing that. I think that's a disaster. By the time you do the rules, it takes 18 months. Guess what? Your threat matrix is completely different. Um, and now you have companies trying to meet the standard that doesn't meet the threat as it's happening today. Um, and I think A, it's a waste of money, and B, I don't really want the government regulating into the internet. I think that would be a disaster. Um, so we're, we're having these discussions. I'll tell you what's interesting, coming out of New York uh, over the weekend, is now these venture capital firms are starting to realize they don't want to invest in a company that is exposed to the vulnerability of getting all that intellectual property of which they invest in sold. And so now they are putting as a part of their contract of investment their own standards on what those networks should look like. And I'm for that. I mean, you got the private sector and these folks who are exchanging money saying, hey, this is important enough for us to say, you want our money? Your system's got to look like this? Perfect. It's fast. They don't have to go to the government for permission. They can set their own standards. And when it changes in six months, you can change with, with the threat matrix. So I think that market force is starting to kick in by the sheer volume of, law, of lost uh, economics in this. Uh, that I think is going to have a great, great outcome. I'll just take a couple more questions if I can. Yes, sir. Um, Andy Cameron with Usher, Nexus. Uh, in the war on drugs, we found out that uh, banks were a big part of uh, the problem of getting money back and forth. And uh, cyber warfare, obviously, uh, a lot of these groups, the non-state uh, sponsored ones, are getting funded somewhere. And uh, banks are involved in this. Uh, we've been talking to uh, a lot of people up in, uh, on Wall Street who want to figure out who they should be dealing with and not dealing with and uh, try and give bad banks uh, bad uh, ratings and stuff. Is there an economic <clears throat> bent to, uh, to this? I mean, beyond on, this on the criminals, you're trying to talk about people trying to launder money or you're trying to talk 
talk about people who are, or did you just say bankers are on drugs? Did I understand? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but there are banks that are clearly uh, funding corporations in China and uh, Asia that are knowingly uh, involved in these type of activities. Is there a way to get Wall Street uh, more involved in uh, proactive risk uh, management? Well, I think, again, the driving force is the, the, the sharing regime. And I do think there's going to be a parallel track here. The only reason I talk about the defense part is because we're so far behind. We haven't even, you know, in the old standard day, we haven't hired one soldier with one rifle yet um, to protect our networks. And, and there's an invasion underway, right? We're way behind the power. We have to fix that part. The second part and parallel part that I think is going to be equally important, where we gain the support of Germany and Japan and South Korea, other innovation economies uh, in the world who are getting absolutely killed, uh, is where we start putting pressure on China directly. The Mandy report was, uh, report was important because it named names. That was really important. And the Chinese hate that. Absolutely. And so what we're going to do is we're going to name more names. And we're going to start ramping this up. Uh, I argue that we ought to look at trade issues when it comes to companies that we have determined have stolen intellectual property, repurposed it, and put it in the market artificially. I'm a passionate believer in that. I'll guarantee you that will definitely get their attention. And again, we have to start putting into place things that take away the benefit of stealing this property and repurposing. We had one American company, it was a well-known manufacturer, estimates, got their, prop, their blueprints for their product stolen. That product is now in production in China. 25,000 American manufacturing jobs, one company. Now they don't talk about it because they're Afraid of the brand, they're afraid of announcing vulnerabilities. They don't, they don't, they don't get out there and wave the flag that they've been hit. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that's happening. There was another company that actually came to us, right, a company named American Semiconductor, who went to uh, China to do a joint venture. Right? He has technology or had technology that would allow windmills and, and uh, solar to be converted to the grid. Right, he had this patented technology. The Chinese government stole it all of it. He went from a company that was valued at $1.8 billion to a company that's worth about $170 million today. Uh, he is no longer doing business in China. The number one company in China doing that business is the company that stole it from him that he did a joint venture with. And I wish I could tell you this is a rare thing. It happens again and again, I can't, I go, there's a line around the Capitol building of companies willing to come in and tell us in a classified setting. I, I get my whole intellectual property portfolio is gone. I mean, I've never seen anything like this where we aren't jazzed and our blood pressure isn't up. I mean, this is unbelievable. Getting all worked up. I apologize on keeping the panel. I one more question and then I'll have to call it up. Because I also have a case for me, so I tell that George Mason is a Well functioning public private partnership to share data at the Holy Grail, and we also have that. And it's still going to put that in practice. Basically, a number of hurdles which make this thing difficult to, to, to come back. Liability, privacy, competition among companies to share data that they show that they are vulnerable and they make it attacked by their competitors. And classification rules about information so that the partnership doesn't work this one way. Can you think something like that in the bill? And if so, how are we going to do that? Or continue to get something to yeah. the if we don't have liability in the bill, he was just saying this is a hard problem to work because you have liability issues with sharing of information and you have what the fear would be is uh, an, an unwieldy cooperation um, competition between companies. And so Yes, we put liability protection in the bill. And again, we did that because it has to be, in my mind, it has to be a voluntary process. You don't want any mandates telling people you must give us information or you must cooperate. We don't do that in the, well, we did it in the FBI, but it was only, you know, you know for the hardest cases. Oh, come on, lighten up, people. Um, and so we did. We built in liability so that they can share. And remember, this still has to happen in a classified way. If you just put all of this open on the open internet, They'll take that source code, change enough of it, it's in. I mean, this stuff is complicated stuff. So they can rework it. 
And so what we've tried to do uh, is do push it as far upstream in the system as you can. So your internet service provider would likely be the first members, uh, I would guess, that would join and say, I want you share with me and I'll tell you what we're catching on our system that's really nasty and we'll build a better system together. And we think that's what happens. Then you'll have that next tier of very capable <laughs> IT companies. If you're at a small company in America, you don't want to build a SCIF and have to meet all the standards of having and maintaining a SCIF and having the people for compliance for the SCIF just to share information if your ISP provider is already getting it, right? I would I would spend money. And so that's where we think we get the value on that downstream. Somebody was talking about supply chain. That supply chain is very vulnerable. That's how we think we can help uh, the supply chain before it ever gets to their network, their personal office network. It has to go through that ISP provider that is sharing classified Thanks, everybody. Get involved in this discussion. It is very, very important.